there's a, there's a deeper level of questioning that we can apply to to some of the things you've described, like, um, you know, what if my, my max pull-ups go way down after this? A lot of the time, the traditional CBT approach would be to, well, let's, let's question that assumption, like, like, who says it's going to go way down? You know, it'll probably come up pretty quickly, muscle memory, you'll get right back. And, and that can all be true, but again, that reinforces this assumption that you can only be okay if your max pull-ups are some certain number, which forces a tenuous relationship between you and peace. You can only be at peace if you can you know, reach a certain level. So from a mindfulness approach, we could we could open to that and be like, yeah, yeah, maybe my, my max whatever is gonna be down. That'll be where I am. And maybe my value as a human being doesn't depend on being able to always perform like a machine. I'm here today with Seth Gillahan, who's a licensed psychologist. He's a podcast host of the show Think, Act, Be, which, by the way, is a framework that you and I are going to explore a lot more in depth in our conversation today. And you are the author of Mindful Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, A Simple Path to Healing, Hope, and Peace. And also, I should note that Seth is also a very patient human being because I had to bump him from an earlier recording slot and he was very kind to uh, allow me to do so and finally get us on the microphone today. So Seth, very excited about having this conversation and happy to have you here. Well, thanks, Zach. Yes, happy to reschedule and, uh, and I am sure this will have been worth waiting for. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Now I know I have to earn that. I want to, to make sure that you feel that it was worth uh, rescheduling, and uh, we'll, we'll see if I can do that. Yeah, I just like to set uh, high expectations. Good. That makes two of us, and I think that's going to factor into some of the conversations we have today about how both of us like to, to set those high expectations and how that can be both a good but also sometimes a bad thing. Um, the, the way that I want to frame this in general, and we may go in a, a lot of different directions, um, but I want to meet a lot of people where they probably are today, which is, wait a second therapy, mental health. Ooh, I don't know this. Uh, I'm not supposed to be talking about this. This kind of makes me sound weak and I don't have it all together and I need to be the one that just shows up and I'm the rock every day. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of the, the stigmas around mental health and therapy. Um, I know that you like to dive right into the specifics, but uh, before doing so, just a little bit of general background for those that are interested um, differences between cognitive behavioral therapy versus maybe psychoanalysis versus other types, just so we can really zoom in as quickly as possible about not only the work you do with cognitive behavioral therapy, but your discovery of how important it is to introduce the mindfulness component. Mm. And then from there, just talking about how can we, you know, better improve our mental health and ultimately get some sense of peace, because I feel, especially in my world of the entertainment industry, peace is the farthest thing from what we're working towards. We are working towards success or awards or image or external validation of who we are is so far from what peace is. And I think the, the older that you get, the more peace becomes important. And I found that if there's one question that I ask myself over and over and over now, am I at peace with how I'm spending my time? So that's, that's kind of a framework for where it is that I want to go. And I guess to get started, um, I just want to learn a little bit more about your origin story, because you've discovered this not through research and analysis, but really through your own personal journey. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Zach. I, uh, it's interesting what you said about having an aversion to therapy or not wanting to face our own sort of limitations or mental health struggles. And I guess, I mean, that's, I, I didn't realize that's where I was for a long time. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have endorsed that. I wouldn't have said, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm denying my, my full humanity with all of its, with all of its uh, limitations. So, but through my, I guess, I mean, 20s, 30s, up until about 40, it was, it was go push. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't working, you know, 70 hours a week or anything, but, uh, but there was a constant sense of what's next, need, need to do more, need to be more productive. Um, and it's funny, I think there was, and I think there is for a lot of us, there was an underlying drive well, that's a fun drive for peace. I was going to say, it's funny to imagine a drive. I'm very ambitious to attain peace. 
but I think that might be part of it. There's this idea of like, okay, I'm, I, I'm going to rest. I just have to do enough. I need to get there, like climb the top of the, you know, I get to the top of the mountain, I'll rest at the top. Or, you know, there's this kind of a joke. People say, I'll rest when I'm dead. So, uh, so I was kind of, you know, burning, burning the candle at both ends. Uh, and then around 40, things started to not go so well with my health. Um, I realized I was burned out mentally, but this was maybe, wow, I guess about eight years ago now, I realized uh, it really taken a toll on my body too. So, which actually is how I came to an interest in integrative medicine myself was through the physical side of things. But, you know, it was a lot of common sort of uh, non-specific symptoms like poor sleep, uh, just like crushing fatigue when I'd always had lots of energy before, early morning runs, doing triathlons, um, and and a lot of difficulty vocally because having a lot of trouble speaking, kept losing my voice, um, had a growth on my vocal cords that was removed, but it came back. So all this is going on. Um, and I realized that I just reached the end of my own resources. I reached the end of myself is how it felt to me. And uh, really reached a hopeless place. I fell into a deep depression. I had to really cut down on my, my practice, my clinical practice hours, um, which led to a lot of financial strain for our family. And... So I was, I, I realized I needed the type of therapy that I was offering to other people. I needed to use some of the cognitive and behavioral techniques, the CBT that, that we'll probably talk about. But, but I realized that I'd lost, not, it wasn't just that I was having symptoms, but it felt like something deeper than that. Again, which I think is a common experience, especially at this sort of midlife point that I was, I kind of lost contact with myself. I'd lost that relationship to myself or realize that I never really had that kind of intimate self-knowledge that's so important. Uh, and so that's what really led me to, to focus more on mindfulness part and being really being present and open and aware of our experience and, and accepting of what's happening, even if we don't like it. And then finding that if, if I approached cognitive techniques, working with my mind and behavioral techniques, shifting my actions, if I integrated openness and a focus on the present, those mindful elements into the cognitive and behavioral approaches, it was just, I just found it much more helpful. I think my clients were also benefiting from more of that integrated approach. So, so it really was through, through a years long struggle that I came to some of the, some of the developments that, that for me really put these, these different strands together in a, in a therapeutic way. I would imagine that for somebody that is a psychologist for a living, I mean, your voice is the tool by which you do your work. I can't imagine the fear you must have experienced knowing you don't have a voice. It's terrifying. Yeah, I remember uh, Chris, uh, New Year's Eve 2016, we had a, a New Year's Eve open house at our house and a good place for an open house in your house. And one of my, and I, I wasn't talking, I, I couldn't speak. I was writing just, you know, to communicate with people, I just write on a piece of paper. They would often respond by writing, which was always funny, just an automatic response. Like, no, no, you can talk. <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> We're not sharing a secret. I'm just having trouble speaking. So anyway, but I've done the same thing. But the point is, uh, one of my, one of my friends uh, brought up a similar thing. He's like, you know, how are you doing with your practice? And I was like, oh my God, it's like, it's terrifying. It was, yeah, absolutely terrifying. I was like, I was thinking like, what are all the jobs I can do that don't require speaking? That was where my fantasy I just need to find something that requires no, no talking at all. Perfect. Well, here's what's interesting about that. And I wanted to go into this a little bit later. Uh, but it's kind of this acceptance of whatever the, the malady is, whether it's in your case, you don't have a voice, or well, I'm depressed, or I'm anxious, or whatever it is, instead of thinking, how do I get my voice so it's better? Your thought process was, well, this is now who I am. 
So how do I structure my life around this ailment? And that's a big part of this process. It's like, I know that for me, um, earlier in my career, uh, and that's not to say that I don't still struggle with it, but I really struggled with depression and burnout, and I didn't understand it at the time. And got to the point where you're basically you're the the frog in boiling water that where you raise the temperature slowly. And I didn't realize how hot the water was. And you just think, this is just who I am now. I'm just irritable and I'm tired all the time and I never want to go out and do anything. But it's not there's something wrong. It's, oh, this is who I am as a person. So I find it interesting that you thought, how do I find jobs where I don't have to speak? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. I mean, it was. It, I, I really have two minds about it now. You know, on the one hand, I found it so one of the most important parts of my healing has really been accepting my, you know, I have to live within certain limitations. You know, I need a nap most days. So, so the, the, the energy issues continue. They're still not exactly clear what, what the heck's going on. Um, and, and I, I need to, you know, I can't just, uh, I don't know, like, oh, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go into the city for the day and just, you know, see what happens. Cause you know, it would, it would just be a major crash and then I'd be stuck and I'd be like, oh man, but yeah, you're right. On the other hand, how do we, how do we accommodate certain limitations without allowing them to completely define who we are on, our, on a deepest, a deepest level? I think of things like, I mean, if, if it were an obvious physical uh, issue uh, like like if I weren't able to walk then obviously I wouldn't insist on you know going places where I have to take the stairs um, but on the other hand I wouldn't only see myself or would, would not want to only see myself as someone who doesn't walk like that's not the the sum total of my identity so so that's that's really been a that's just kind of an ongoing evolution of of you know, where where is that line between acceptance but also continuing to strive for you know for for a fix and i think that that's where uh, mindfulness can potentially come in and you're certainly the expert on this and not me um, but i know that's something that i've become more mindful of and in a second i want to kind of get more just to, to a little bit more of the basics of understanding cognitive behavioral therapy what mindfulness is etc but one thing that I've noticed uh, based on what you're talking about is the level of mindfulness that I have about the language of how I speak about myself. An example being, I am somebody that suffers from this thing, right? So, oh, I am so ADD, that's language versus I am currently distracted. It's identity versus situation, right? And in this case, it was uh, it's less a matter of, well, I am somebody who's depressed versus I'm experiencing feelings of depression. That to me was a level of mindfulness I didn't have before of how powerful the language was and how I was labeling and talking about myself. And I'm guessing that's something that you notice a lot in your practice. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is. It, it's a it's a fairly subtle point, but but such an important one. That idea of I mean I've I've even had experiences of uh Remember, I was so, I forget the issue, but so bummed out about something one time and kind of feeling sorry for myself. I was exhausted. So I was, I was lying in bed. Um, you just, just sort of like fell into bed in the early evening. You're just like, oh, so sad. And, and at first, you know, I was completely identified with that experience. And then there was a part of me that could kind of, hold all of that experience and awareness and and relate to myself and say yeah you're having a tough time aren't you i was like yeah i'm having a tough time but just that ability to sort of be the observer or to have a kind of relationship between i and me was so you know i, I was still in pain but it wasn't as as all encompassing or all defining it was like yeah i'm i'm having a difficult time right now and and that's all right that's not that's not going to last forever. And there's a part of me that can kind of offer myself compassion, which I mean, to be honest, Zach, if I had heard myself saying these things a few years ago, it probably would have totally creeped me out. Like having compassion for myself. Ugh, ick. That's not what ambitious people do. They just push through, right? Right. They just, yeah. They, they put their nose to the grindstone. Just get things done. Yeah. What are you soft? Yeah. Yeah. We all are. We all have 
We all have soft underbellies. So what I want to go into now, and it's funny because I just had this conversation uh, where I was a guest on somebody else's podcast, and they had asked me a really interesting question that I had to think about a little before I answered, which is, if you don't have that, that awareness, how do you develop that awareness? And mindfulness is a part of it. And one of the things that I'd suggested is that there's there's a certain level of awareness you can cultivate within yourself, but we as humans are not wired to introspectively just be able to go inside and see ourselves objectively and understand our patterns of behaviors and thoughts, etc. We really need that reflection from an outside party. And I think that to me is where, at least for me, I can speak from my own experience, therapy has been absolutely transformational. It wasn't a matter of, oh, I just kind of needed to get it out of my system and talk about all these things that were bothering me. It really helped me develop such a keener sense and awareness of who I am, how I'm wired, what are my tendencies. And once you flip the awareness switch on, there is no going back. That's mostly for better. It's a little for worse because sometimes being aware of things is not so fun when right. you have issues that need work to be worked on. Um, but I want to talk more about where therapy can be tremendously beneficial in general. And then I just, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but for those that don't have a lot of background, very briefly unpacking what is cognitive behavioral therapy specifically in the realm of talk therapy versus psychoanalysis, just kind of giving people a primer to be like, okay, I get the basics. Yeah, you're right. Though it can be so valuable to, to have that different perspective, especially for someone who's, who's very, uh, maybe self-assured in certain ways and we're used to uh being right uh or thinking we have the answers and so it's it's possible to bring that same mentality into therapy and and basically tell the therapist like what's true this is this is what i know about myself and so we need someone who is is able to see and willing to to point out our blind spots because we all have blind spots so so in in psychodynamic therapy, which most people are, are probably you know, most people probably think of when they think of therapy, it's you know it's it's based fairly loosely uh, most of the time on Sigmund Freud's ideas of you know the unconscious and the effects of of childhood difficulties and traumas and the need to work through <clears throat> these unconscious conflicts because they're showing up in, in our everyday life in ways we don't necessarily understand. So in that context, the, the therapist or the analyst is, I mean, to a large extent seen as the expert um, and the, the, the client relies on the expert therapist's interpretations of like, Oh, this is what's happening. Oh, and that provides insight and shifts things. And, and, and that approach can be extremely helpful for people. Uh, a lot of people people find it extremely beneficial, transformational, life changing. At the same time, uh, it it can also take a long time uh, to you know to work through a lot of these sort of underlying dynamics to try to understand them. So if I came in, you know, said you know, I'm getting into these arguments with my wife, and uh, you know, it's really affecting our relationship and you know, things are on the rocks. And if I talked to a dynamic therapist about that. Most likely they're going to want to talk about my, my childhood, maybe especially my relationship with my mother. Um, you know, if there are you know, certain incidents from my childhood that bring up certain patterns that are then getting replayed in my, in my marriage. And again, all that can be very valuable and, and insightful. And on the other hand, cognitive behavioral therapy would approach it with a more, more of a kind of problem solving and skills focused approach. Uh, it's less about unearthing these hidden dynamics. I mean, it, it is about that in a way, but they're, but they're not unconscious. They're, or at least they're not inaccessible to consciousness. They're not these sort of deeply buried childhood traumas. But maybe more like, you know, what what does your mind tell you when your wife says, you know, when she asks you to do something you forgot to do? Oh, well, I say, you know, she's, uh, you know, she thinks she's better than me. Oh, all right. So that's a, you know, a belief. And then in the cognitive part of CBT, we would take a look at that. Like, all right. So 
so your your thought is my wife thinks she's better than me how does that make you feel well pissed off um uh down on myself of uh, you know, defensive all right makes sense given that you believe that that reaction makes total sense then let's look at the evidence like so how do you know that she's looking down on you well um and maybe there's there's not any clear evidence for it and then we go through you know are there other <clears throat> other possible interpretations and so it's like well maybe maybe she's asking me to do it just because she she can't do it herself and she wants it to get done oh all right and that would lead to a different set of feelings uh, and probably less defensiveness less conflict so in certain situations like that the you uh a person can find relief a lot of a lot of, a lot of the time really quickly with these more kind of more sort of in the moment interventions and skills that we can use right away uh, and they're very straightforward like logical and they're things that all of us can can do they're sort of intuitive uh, so and and then with the behavioral approach we would just you know, maybe practice let's let's try out some new skills let's try you know a different way of of responding or, or what if you took care of the that thing before your wife had to ask you a third time to do it like how that how might that affect your relationship how can you make it easier to do those things before uh, it leads to conflict so that's just an example but but cbt in general tends to be more present focused it doesn't ignore the past it might actually get into some of those childhood dynamics like you know where did this assumption come from uh, that if if a woman is asking you to do something then she must be upset with you maybe it does bring up some you know early mom interactions but we would deal with it more on the level of of how we how those beliefs were entrained rather than um these kind of unconscious conflicts you know often with a kind of of you know sexual air to some extent um and and again uh, I mean CBT isn't always brief but but it tends to be relatively short and uh a person can can benefit pretty quickly often in like eight to ten sessions the impression that I've gotten from it not being a, a licensed professional uh but it, just to kind of uh, put a you know put a stamp on what you said is that there's a little bit more of a proactive sense of action steps and a little bit more coaching mixed with therapy and I've done multiple different forms of therapy. I've done the the psychoanalysis where it's just a deep dive for months into, like you said, relationship with your mother or father, a lot of, you know, what are the, the beliefs that were coded within you very early in life? How does that better help you understand or become aware of the way you react to certain things or the way that you view your ambition or your fear of failure, fear or fear of success, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember at one point telling the therapist, um, this is great and all, but I want homework. I want action steps. What can I do? He's like, that's not what we do here. Cause it was a very different form of therapy. And for me, again, going back this, uh, this joke of being super ambitious and driven, I always want to say, here's the problem. What is it that I can do to take action on it? And that's where CBT is a little bit different from some of other traditional forms where they're, like you said, more present focused, more coaching fo focused, more sense of here's something I can work on between sessions. But the, the next part of it that I want to dig into, is, and I know that you feel the same way that I do because you write about it, it's also very much entrenched in the Western medical system of it's my job to diagnose a symptom and give you a treatment rather than spend the time understanding the root cause as much, which is, I, I know that's an area you got a little bit stuck too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of the, a lot of the problem is that, well, a couple things. One is with the medical model, as I describe in the book, like there's things are only ever as good as your baseline. And so it's like, it's, it's uh, the, the metaphor is sort of like a car coming off an assembly line when the car comes off it's it's the best it's ever going to be and then if there's a problem you take it in and fix it but for the most part i mean you know unless you're uh, someone who's really into cars and getting them souped up and whatever it's not a growth setup it's it's let's let's keep this thing you know going as as well as we can 
Um, but unless something's broke broken, then there's no there's nothing really to to do with your car. You're not trying to. You don't really have a growth mindset with your car most of the time. So so it's limiting in in that way, and that there's no inherent idea of growth. But also, I think that symptom focus can ignore, as you suggested, the the underlying cause. And in a way, I mean, I've seen, I think, in in a broad way, I think our our society may be relying on mindfulness in this way a lot of the time, which is, I'm not going to make substantial changes to my life, even though I may be living an insane lifestyle. I just need the hacks that are going to allow me to perpetuate that insane lifestyle. We don't use those words, obviously, but 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 the idea is I just I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. What can you give me so I can keep doing what I'm doing? So I think of things like you know living a life of alienation and self focus and disconnection, and then winding up depressed or anxious or or uh, you know, abusing substances, and then looking for medical treatment for that, as if that's the solution. Like, yeah, what you need is just, uh, oh, you need an antidepressant. When I mean, if you look at your life, it's like you're living in a desert, just a, a place that's devoid of all the the natural things that keep us feeling well and doing well and, and not being depressed. But it's like we want to we want to stay in the desert and just, well, let's just, I'll just drink more water. I'm just going to live in this desert and drink more water. I'm like, yeah, maybe you'll, maybe that'll get you through for a while. But I, I'm, I'm talking. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking to other people, but I'm really kind of re, re, going through my own experience, which was I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. And finally, I had to step back and be like, I can't do this. Well, why did I assume I could just keep living this way and make it okay with these outside fixes? And one of those outside fixes, as you mentioned, that's very highly overly prevalent in the Western medical training would be medication. And I know that for you, kind of the, the realization, and I just want to make it super clear to everybody listening, do not characterize this as Zach said, you shouldn't take medication if you're depressed or anxious or ADD or whatever. I've talked extensively about my experience with medications. I've taken them and I absolutely endorse them in a certain context, but it can't be the only solution and it can't be the long term for life solution, which, as I'm sure you could speak to for some people is. But I think for a larger percentage, it doesn't have to be a long term lifelong solution, but because it's quote unquote easier rather than the deeper introspection and the mindfulness, it just kind of becomes the new normal. Yeah, I think one of the real disservices that a medicalized view of our psychology has done with, I mean, mostly with good intentions, or at least with partly with good intentions, you know, there, there was this idea of, look, these are, these are real medical conditions. People aren't making this up. You can see them in the brain to some extent. Uh, you know, there are differences in the brain chemistry of of people who have you know, certain di- uh, psychiatric diagnoses, which is maybe true, but there's not great evidence for that actually either. But, you know, this, it, it was helpful to some extent, but then the over, over biologicalization of, of these conditions led to this faulty assumption that if you have a psychological diagnosis, then the real treatment is going to be something biological. It's going to be medication. Uh, in some cases, you know, they, they even do things like, uh, like well, electro, electroconvulsive therapy, of course, ECT, um, or even deep brain stimulation, where they implant electrodes deep in the brain and uh, attach it to a to a uh, something outside that delivers an electric current. So. There's nothing wrong with any of those treatments, and as you said, they can be very effective and helpful. But, but this assumption that that that's the only real cure leads to well, again, leads to it leads us away from addressing what might be underlying. And in, in some cases, probably in most cases, I'm not saying that everyone who is depressed, you know, it's just because their life isn't arranged in a certain way. But if you just look at the numbers, the number of people who are depressed in our society, it's really staggering. And if you if you overlay the 
you know, the, the wide availability of, of medications like uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, like fluoxetine. There's, it's not like it's helping, it's not like it's fixing the problem. It's not making it better. I, I don't know what the numbers would be without those medications, but it's hard to imagine they'd be higher. So in any case, there, there's this study showing that you know, if you implant electrodes in someone's brain and deliver an electric current deep in the brain, deep brain stimulation, this is some of, of uh, Helen Mayberg's work. If you, if you deliver that current to people who are severely depressed, who haven't responded to other treatments, you know, they haven't been helped by multiple rounds of different uh, medications and electroconvulsive therapy, for, for almost everyone, when, when they turn on the machine, the electric current starts, the person has a sense of, wow, like, like the clouds sort of part and they feel better. And then a good number of people fall back into depression. Others stay well. And from the research that I've, I've seen, it seems that the ones who stay well are the ones who make significant changes in their lives in a way that support their more positive mood, which I just find that so striking that even something as deeply, no pun intended, biological as deep brain stimulation, it's its ongoing success relies on the, the mental and behavioral changes that we make in our lives. So the, the problem hasn't been understanding that you know, the, 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 the relationship between the psychological and the, the biological or the, the mental and the physical, but it's been assuming that the arrow runs in one direction, that it's only that the biology affects the psychology, but I mean, there's lots of research showing we need to be aware that the, our psychology in exactly the same way has powerful effects on our biology. And I think in a lot of ways, without uh, turning it into a whole part two of the podcast, there's a lot of research that's showing that the psychology in many ways can be a lot more powerful than the biology, just the power of the mind and intention and focus and mindfulness and all these different areas. Um, that if, if I had to choose between the two, even though it takes more work and might take more time, I'm going to choose to go the psychological route and the, the mental route and really making sure that, uh, the beliefs that I have and the thoughts that I have are what are driving my progression, as opposed to knowing it's just the, the pill, so to speak. But one of the things that I found uh, in my own personal experience and those of others, and again, I'm coming from this from totally non-licensed, non-trained, um, but I find that if you get to the point that you can't drive the thoughts and like knowing that exercise, for example, is going to make you feel good enough to, you know, generate more positive thoughts. I've always likened it as uh, mentally with depression or anxiety, you're in a hole and you get to a point where without a ladder, you can't even get your head above ground to crawl out. And I've always seen the medication as the ladder. I just, I need to get my head back to daylight and I need to crawl out of the hole now I can start taking actions. And I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, this is a, an article that you'd written for Psychology Today about how do you know when it is time for therapy? And you know, if we can, we can, if we wanted to couple it with medication, we certainly could. But just for those that are thinking, I don't know for sure if this is something that I just need to be mindful and meditate more versus I really need to seek a professional. What are some key indicators that it might be time to at least explore getting outside help? Mm. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I would say is, is whenever you think it's time, it can be time. You know, I, just I would actually that... say when you think it's time, it's probably too late. That, <laughs> yeah. like it's the, the, and this came up in my conversation about burnout, but they said, you know, when do you know you're burned out? And I said, as soon as you're asking, am I burned out? It's already too late. Yeah. So I don't know if yeah. you feel similarly of, with that way about, you know, maybe it's time to, to see somebody, maybe not quite as pronounced, but. Um... Well, in our society, I mean, most of the time when I, when I would see someone in therapy, it's, it was when things had gotten really, really bad. Um, sometimes people came a little more proactively, but, but the vast majority of the time it was, it was like things, things the, the, the sort of the, the sentiment seemed to be things got so bad. I had to get therapy. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like I reached, like I'd really hit bottom, which you know, it's unfortunate that we see things that way sometimes, but 
but I, I just want people to know that there's, it, it's sort of like, it's the flip side of the question in a way. Um, like, so some people are, who are considering quitting alcohol will ask, am I an alcoholic? As if, if the answer is no, then they have to keep drinking. Or like, is my drinking bad enough that I can stop? Like, well, no, it's up to you. Like, it doesn't have to get bad enough. It's just like, if you feel like it's a net negative in your life, you can stop whenever you want. So I'm speaking as someone who decided that for myself a while back. So on the on the therapy side, you know, if a person is thinking, yeah, I'm thinking about therapy, but I don't really know if I need it. I'm not sure it's bad enough. Then yes, I think that's that's a great time to to pursue it. Uh, but but in terms of signs of a person's looking for sort of markers, when things are, uh, you know, despite your best intentions, you're trying to trying to sort of right the ship, but it seems like you're just you're just taking on more water. Um, that's a good time to seek therapy. And also, you know, speaking of outside perspectives, when someone you you love and and trust in your life, you know, suggests it, then I think it's a good thing to consider. Not for them. It's usually not helpful to to do therapy for someone else. Uh, but but you know, considering that maybe they have your best interest at heart and they see things that you don't, and and again, it might be worth worth considering. Uh, and there are other reasons, but I think those are two big ones. All right. So given that we've talked a little bit uh, about the basics, kind of understanding just, you know, on a tertiary level, what is therapy, what is CBT versus psychoanalysis, for example, um, and some of the the challenges that might come with the traditional model. I really now want to dig into the whole reason that you're here. It's not just, you know, can you lecture us and explain to us the basics of CBT? It's your personal discovery and how you've integrated mindfulness into this practice because it's infused a whole new level of having this ingredient that's getting you such amazing results, both personally, but with your clients. So let's start talking about what we mean by mindfulness in this context. And then I want to dig into how you're actually using it. Hmm. Yeah, mindfulness is, is defined in different ways, but I think of it as, I mean, one of one of my favorite ways of thinking about it is just coming home, coming home to our experience, coming home to ourselves, coming home to this moment in a way that we can we can be who we are and and we can open to things as they are, including ourselves, opening to ourselves as we are, which is different from our our typical kind of default stance, which is to, I mean, our minds tend to be elsewhere. We tend to be kind of pushing away things that are happening, uh, you know, saying, I don't like this, or I want things to be this way. I'm you know, craving certain experiences or rejecting other ones. There's nothing bad about doing those, doing those things. You know, we shouldn't feel, there's no reason to feel bad about those, those tendencies, but, but they often lead to unhappiness because we're, you know, constantly living in a state of, of how can I improve things? How can I uh, make this moment better? How can I get rid of this pain? And again, there's nothing wrong with those very understandable uh, tendencies. But, um, but you know, like when I was when I was really struggling at, at the in the depths of my my sickness. I was resisting it so much, feeling like this shouldn't be happening. I shouldn't be feeling this way. I have to make it stop. And then reading, uh, I read some, this passage from this, this contemporary Stoic philosopher, Bill Ferriola, talking about how we all suffer. It's part of being human. You'll, you'll have more suffering in your life. And just that realization, like, oh, this isn't outside of life. This isn't something, this aberration life is imposing on me. This is just part of being alive. And there was such, there was such rest in that realization. So that's what, for me, a lot of what mindfulness is about is about finding true rest, a rest that doesn't that doesn't depend on fixing our circumstances to to match our expectations. Yeah, that word fixing is a big one. That was exactly where I was going to go next is 
uh, the way that we are conditioned in society, going back to this, <clears throat> excuse me, this idea of being so ambitious and driven and goal oriented and moving forwards, the assumption is I'm going to go to therapy because something's broken and I need you to help me fix it. And that's like we said, with, with the medication or even with some of the standard talk therapy treatments, here's the problem. Let's fix it so we can meet the expectation that we're not meeting. And mindfulness is a very different approach where it isn't necessarily about, I have to fix this problem, but I just have to be more aware of it and bring it kindness and compassion. Yeah. Yeah. And it is such a different approach. I feel like it's made all the difference in, you know, in these past few years. It's not that I don't still struggle at times, you know, and fight against things as they are, but, but even just knowing that there's this other possibility, you know, that, oh yeah, I don't have to, I don't have to, you know, constantly be battling against my experience. Um, that's, it never stops being a relief to every time I re re remember that. So how do we actually use that? Because mindfulness for a lot of people can either grate on their nerves or it's like, oh, yeah, that's those platitudes that I see on Instagram quote cards or it's all this new agey, you know, airy fairy stuff. And uh, mindfulness can be one of the most powerful forces in the universe. But I think that we need to to give a little bit more context of how it can actually be such a, a powerful tool outside of what I think some people might just assume what it is based on kind of the, the colloquial understanding. Yeah, Zach, this is one thing I can get kind of worked up about because uh, because there is so much, there's so much, there's such richness in being in our lives as they are and opening to our experience and the fact that we label that mindfulness, I think can be, I mean, it's it's a label, so it's label, so it's helpful to some extent. You know, we can talk, we're like, oh yeah, we're talking about the same thing, more or less. But labels are also limiting, and it it narrows down our idea of what we're talking to something that has become very commodified. So now it's, you know, it often seems to me it's like mindfulness TM, or some people have called it Mick Mindfulness. Mm, I've you never know, heard that of, before, but I, I love that Mick mindfulness. Yeah, I think, yeah, this sort of like this fast food version, you know, I'm gonna get my drive through mindfulness. Ah, I get my, you know, got my shot of my shot of mindfulness. Now I'm good for for, you know, the rest of the rest of the day. Um, I think it can be a good thing on the one hand to make these make these ideas more widely available. But I don't think it's a benign benign issue to to offer something that you call one thing when in fact it's a, an extremely watered down version of that thing so for example if someone told you like oh have you ever had chocolate oh no i've never had chocolate what is it like oh it's great you know and, and they gave you i don't know it's like like the worst kind of like a, to a tootsie roll Tootsie rolls are fine for Tootsie rolls, but like if that's your like that's what you think chocolate is, like compared to like a really nice truffle or you know dark chocolate or like whatever, you know, there's so many good kinds of chocolate now. You might be like, yeah, chocolate's okay. You know, I, I don't really see what all the fuss is about. And so I think that's what for me, that's what that's what McMindfulness is, is it's it's like the Tootsie Roll version of dark chocolate. Like, why? If you think that mindfulness just boils down to to a you know a three minute breathing exercise that helps you calm down, like I mean that's there's nothing wrong with that. That's obviously be a very good thing. But but it's a problem when we assume that it's been that that distillation captures the entire experience of what's possible. Because as I found and, and a lot of people have found, mindfulness can really be life-changing you know, in, in a deeply profound way. And I get that it's irritating. I find myself irritated by a lot of mindfulness too. This is the other part of it that irks me. And it's all the bullshit that often comes along with mindfulness. You know, it's the the trappings, the, this idea of, of like, and this is, this is probably not the highest version of myself speaking, but it's the, it's the one that, you know, has to have a certain voice and it has to all be very like, nice and gentle and i've got my mindfulness voice on and you know i can have my mindfulness voice 
as much as anyone else. So I'm not just pointing the finger here, but but again, it has this, as you said, this sort of airy fairy idea or kind of sensibility that doesn't feel like it's connected to our real lives. Because I know your life isn't like that, and I know my life isn't like that. I know it's there's a lot more grit to it. It's a lot, you know, more raw than that. And so this idea of like, oh yeah, like you had a shitty day. All right, so just you know, do your your three minute breathing exercise, and and you know, just be in the moment. Just be in the moment. I mean, and and people, I mean, call bullshit on that because they can they can see it. So. Again, I'm not I'm not suggesting that th- that those things. I mean, probably if you're having an awful day and you spend three minutes breathing, that's that can actually be a great thing, um, and and can change things profoundly. But um, so I'm not I have a completely clear uh, message that I'm saying here, Zach. But well, l- let me just be the first to say that I've never talked to anybody about mindfulness where they have wrapped it up with both McDonald's and Tootsie Rolls. Um, that's the, and the, the, and I, I laugh and I make a joke of it, but I also have to be perfectly honest and say, this is really giving me another perspective and lens to see this through, uh, which I think is very, very valuable. And it lends to, I think a really important question. Let's assume that people at least know what mindfulness is. Let's say that we've learned about mindful eating or mindful exercise. And it's about being more present in the moment, which again, these are all good things. We're not saying they're bad things. Well, let's assume that's the extent of our knowledge of mindfulness, which in a way is the the Tootsie Roll, or let's go one layer better. It's a Snickers bar of mindfulness, right? It's it's okay, and it's not like, to me, Tootsie Rolls are just, I hate Tootsie Rolls. So that was, <laughs> for me, that was a bad example, because I hate them. But, you know, Snickers bar, it's fine. I like the taste, but it's not, I would never consider it decadent. But it helps me understand, okay, so this is chocolate, this isn't bad, but I still don't understand what chocolate can truly be in my life. Explain to me what is the decadent truffle version of mindfulness, in your opinion? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a nice way to set it up. So let me let me walk through an example. So if you imagine, if you imagine you had a, a really rough day and you're feeling you know stressed out, frazzled, uh, you know scattered, uh, your mind is all, or your body's all tense and revved up. And you could, you might decide that, oh, I need, I need to do a, like a calming meditation now. Uh, so you, you know, so you do some practice in mindfulness and you, you relax and you, you feel, feel a bit calmer. And that, you know, it could happen relatively quickly. It can be very powerful. And yet we're left, we can be left with the impression that my well being depends on getting rid of those uncomfortable experiences. Do I have to, I can't be okay if I'm stressed out and and revved up and tense. I have to make those experiences go away. And mindfulness is going to help me to make those experiences go away. But I think the more all-encompassing approach of mindfulness that a lot of people find is that I don't have to change my experience in order to be okay. That I can open to things exactly as they are. I can, with practice, I can or even just in a moment, I can make room for what's already here instead of thinking I have to change what's here before I can be okay. I think that's where the, that's where the the cognitive side of CBT and the mindfulness and acceptance really meet is in recognizing that we can bring certain beliefs and assumptions to our mindfulness practice, including this idea of like, I need to focus my attention in the present, and that's the only way I can be mindful. If I'm not focused on the present, then I'm, I'm screwing up my mindfulness, and I need to make my experiences change, or I need to make myself accept how I'm feeling right now. As opposed to an approach where we, we're able to make room for all of our experience, even saying like, yeah, right now, I don't feel like practicing mindfulness. Right now, the idea of like being mindfully present, like I just find it irritating. Like, all right, that is fine. There's room for that too. There's room for you exactly as you are. And that, I mean, talk about liberating. That is just so, that's just so freeing and freeing ourselves from the assumption that 
I can only be okay if things work out the way that my mind tells me they need to. That's just, that, that for me has really been, uh, it's been pretty revolutionary. Yeah. It's going back to something you said a few minutes ago, what I would call a case of the shoulds. I shouldn't be feeling this way, or I should be at this point, whatever it might be versus this is where I am now. Right. It is what it is. And I think that, um, this idea, like you said, of make mindfulness being, all right, I've had a crazy day. I've been running around. I've got all these emails, but I need to make sure to get in that, that three minute meditation with my call map. Okay. Now I'm mindful, right. Versus knowing that everything that's going on in your life and what you're feeling doesn't have to be fixed. So that this is broken and it needs to be fixed by a three minute app or a therapy session or a medication, all these reasons, as opposed to, all right, this is where I am right now. And that's something that I, I've really experienced the profoundness of this. It's both profound and it sucks at the same time, because when you accept it, then you realize, all right, well, this isn't going to maybe change as fast as I would like it to, which again is both profound and frustrating, but then you accept, all right, so I'm frustrated right now. It's just, it's, it's for me, I found that, like you said, it's just, it's very liberating. Uh, and I'm, I'm going through a similar uh, just experience uh, at the moment where people would assume that because of what I do talking about overcoming burnout and moving your career forwards and mindfulness and all these things, I've got it all figured out. I've checked off those boxes. I've moved on. Those are no longer problems in my life that I've fixed. I'm in it right now, struggling with lack of energy. I don't have a lot of consistency with my workouts. Some of it is stemming from a very specific incident uh, about a month ago where I injured my shoulder and 80% of the exercises and work that I do training to be a quote unquote ninja in the sport of ninja is all grabbing and climbing and pull-ups and everything else. And I can't even close a car door. So it's removed this portion of a, a very large part of my identity that also from the physical side was helping with the neurochemistry of my brain. And the old me would have been all about, I've got to figure out how to fix this. I've got to, you know, whether it's the medication or I need to switch to this exercise or that exercise. And what I found through my own mindfulness practice, which by the way, still needs a lot of help. And you might end up being my, uh, my therapist for the last 10 minutes of this session. Uh, but for what I found even through the mindfulness practice I've already done is that I do wake up thinking, all right, so today I didn't wake up when I wanted to. I didn't do my morning exercises. That's where I am today. Doesn't mean that's where I'm going to be tomorrow. Doesn't mean that's where I'm going to be in a week. And the thought process used to be, oh my God, this is just who I am now. I'm somebody that skips workouts and I don't exercise. And I'm somebody that eats junk food as opposed to this is just where I am, but also mm. not, well, I guess this is okay. And it's the new me. I still want to find a way to work through it. And maybe I'm trying to fix it. I don't know. Maybe I haven't gotten to the point of acceptance because I don't want to accept the place that I am now. What I do accept is this is where I am now. So right. I don't I don't know if that's if I'm getting closer to the truffle version or if maybe I'm one half a step above a Snickers bar. I'm not sure yet, but I I love this spectrum of mindfulness and chocolate. So yeah, you know it, it's interesting as you say that, Zach. Well, first of all, I'm sorry about your shoulder. I hope it hope it feels better soon. Yeah, yeah. Those limitations I know can be so can be so painful. Um, I realized I. There's something not really in the spirit of mindfulness on my part to uh, set up this kind of hierarchy of like more and less mindful experiences. Um, so, but I also just think it's true. So maybe it's maybe it's unavoidable. But but what I what I don't want is for you or anyone else to kind of judge themselves as if you know like I'm being I'm being good at mindfulness or I'm, I'm being bad at mindfulness or my mindfulness isn't as good as someone else's. Um, but but more about just for each of us finding something that is is closer to what works for us, um, and and with acceptance of where you are, I think again that's something that that could be folded into like all right, I'm I'm having a hard time accepting where I am right now. That's just where I am. I'm struggling with acceptance, and there's room for that. Right, you're allowed to struggle with acceptance. There's nothing again. That's that's that would be such a limiting and is that is such a limiting view of mindfulness for a lot of people is this idea of like what well, needs to be like this and if you're not being like that then you're not measuring up. No, step back, step back, broaden, broaden. It's all you're allowed to have your experience. That's I think that is 
for me and for a lot of people, I think the really frustrating thing about mindfulness is when it becomes a kind of dogmatically narrow constraint on the experiences we're allowed to have. Like, oh no, you, you need to, whoa, hold on, that's not very mindful. Um, so, all right, but I think you By the way, there, there's I... something very mindful about you being mindful of your lack of mindfulness. Yeah. Right. It's just, it's just, it's this weird cycle of, oh, well, yeah. I'm being mindful about the fact that this is not very mindful, which, so it's, it, you know, becomes this, this, uh, interesting self-fulfilling prophecy, but, um, that, that, that I, in, in and of itself is a really interesting discussion about what mindfulness is. Cause it's really hard to pin down. Cause like you said, it is the truth that there is kind of the spectrum, but it's not being very mindful of the mindfulness. If I think there's a spectrum, it's, this is a very esoteric, very hard thing write a definition of or to feel yeah, or to describe yeah. or to explain which is the essence of it right um but if i wanted to develop more mindfulness to be aware of the situation or to develop a acceptance and not feel so much friction with where i am now like what what, what is it that i can do i mean we can literally turn this into a, a therapy session if you wanted to whether it's a series of questions but just to, to have somebody better understand because as we said, CBT, there are more tools and a little bit more sense of I want to be able to do something with it. Um, we could unpack my entire history of achievement and, you know, being an overachiever and where that stems from with my mom versus my dad. We don't need to do any of that because we can focus more on here's the situation now. And I know that me personally, this is not an exercise for the sake of the podcast. This is something I've been struggling with that is having negative repercussions on me. And mindfulness is a constant struggle for me. Mm. So what's an example of how I can work through this without feeling yeah. like it has to be fixed? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think so, you know, I have this this think, act, be approach, which is you know, shorthand for cognitive, behavioral, and mindfulness in that order. Um, but the, the order I prefer to do them in usually starts with be, with being. So, um, and it can be, the process can be triggered by anything, but but a common trigger is realizing you're really stuck in a difficult emotion. You're fighting against something, you're feeling you know, caught up or uh, gripped. Gripped is a common, mm. a common sensation, I'm gripped by something. Stuck is, a, is the one that immediately pops out for me. If there yep. were one word to explain how I feel, it's stuck. So that, yeah. that would be a good place to start for sure. Yeah, so feeling stuck. So then, so start with, start with the B and and just you can do a very simple practice to come back into connection with yourself and what's happening. So, I mean, a, a, probably the most common uh, exercise is just to take a breath in and a breath out, just with awareness, just realizing, okay, no breathing. So even that simple breath can bring us back to ourselves. You can take a few breaths if you want, and then. A question I love is, what is actually happening right now? It seems like a simple question, but no, like, what is actually happening right now? Because we get into all these stories about, like, well, I have to do this, and this is going on, and then this is going to happen. Uh, but yeah, what's what's actually happening right now? So identify what that is. Well, I'm, you know, I, I'm not able to do the workout that I usually do, or I'm having pain just closing the car door, and how am I ever going to, you know, get back to my ninja training? Um, and so, I, you know, identifying what's, what's happening. Oh, okay. I'm having an experience and I'm having a reaction to it. So that's sort of coming, coming back and identifying what's actually happening. And that's the mindful part. And then from there, you can ask like, what questions or what, uh, what thoughts am I having? So this is the think part. What am I telling myself? Well, I'm telling myself it's always going to be this way, or I've become this type of person who you know, doesn't uh, you know, do these intense workouts anymore. I'm never going to be able to you know, get back to my my group you know, doing this ninja training. I'm, I'm assuming it's with a group. That, that's funny. That's a huge component of this is the lack of community that happens when I can't participate in all yeah. the activities that I do, because community is such a huge part of the sport. Huge, so like yeah. a, a challenge that I have is I've had a group for almost five years now. We're almost like clockwork. Every Saturday afternoon, email goes out, who's coming to the workout Sunday morning? 
And I've always prided myself on being the person that says, I'm there. I'm the most consistent and I show up. If you can count on one person to always be there, it's me. And having to respond to that and say, nope, can't make it, that's an attack on my identity. That's hard. It's a yep. really, really hard component of this um, beyond just the fact that I can't exercise as much as I want or um, like if we're the thoughts that are going through my mind, one of them as well. The next time I try to do pull-ups, my max reps is going to go way down. I put so much effort into getting to the point where I was. Now I have to start all over. Um, those are those are a lot of the thoughts that start mm -hmm. coming to mind. But what's what's interesting is you are coming at it from a slightly different direction that I assumed. And when you said kind of what, where are you right now? Like just being present with what's going on, you were thinking in the practical. And I immediately went to the next level of what's really going on. So the word that popped into my head without thinking about anything is what's really going on right now. The word was healing. Mm. Right. But I'm fighting against that so much because healing is taking time. Yeah. And I should be doing the following things. I shouldn't be sitting around allowing the healing to occur. But what's really happening right now in my mind, I would assume, I hope, is healing. Yeah, and the healing probably gets in the way of your identity as someone who's able to do everything like before. Yes, I think identifying I think those that underlying dynamic is great, but that that pause allows you to identify exactly that. What's happening? Healing. That's that's great. There's a positive process going going on here, and you recognize it's there's there's there are two edges to it because healing also means resting to some extent. So you've come into the present, you've identified thoughts, and you can start to question those thoughts. Are they completely true? Do they tell the whole story? Do they leave something out? Um, is there another way of seeing things? Is there a different interpretation? So that's the think part. And then the act part is, like, what, what's one simple thing uh, you can do right now that's like, what, what is this moment calling for? What action from you is called for right now? I don't know what it would be, but but you might have a sense of that. Like, what is what is one thing that would that would embody mindful acceptance? Because mindfulness isn't just about thinking a certain way or directing our attention, but it's also about what we do, and we can we can act in a way, we can behave in a way that that demonstrates acceptance, like doing you know a workout that works for us rather than trying to you know, slug our way through something we're not ready for and then hurting ourselves. So I mean, do you have a sense of what, what that one act might be? Yeah, I think that it's, uh, it's a process I've already been going through that I'm still somewhat struggling with and where, like I said, the, if there was a word, it's I feel stuck. Um, but what I have been doing is going out and hiking because my legs oh, yeah. still work fine. Yep. And hiking has been a great way just for me in general to get out and get some fresh air. And I actually find that a lot of, a lot of my best creative brainstorms go come while I'm on hikes. So I've just kind of been doubling up on, well, if I'm stuck with trying to, to write an outline for a newsletter, or right now I'm building a workshop, why not couple those together and to get unstuck and go out because I can at least walk. I can't do a super high intensity ninja workout, but I can at least walk or go hiking. Um, so that's kind of been one of those actions that I can take. I think the, even though this is a little bit meta, another one of the actions is choosing to have this conversation on a recorded podcast and digging into it with somebody that really knows what's going on. Um, cause I think that, a, an earlier version of me would not have been willing to bring this up, especially with an audience that sees part of my identity as being the go-getter and being the ninja and achieving all these goals. Like. I wouldn't be bringing this up publicly. Are you crazy? Like the fact that I'm struggling and I'm not exercising right now and, you know, I'm making poor choices and sleeping in. And I think that in and of itself is one of those actions is being willing to have this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad that you, that you were willing to do that. Uh, there's a couple of things I would, I would add, um, you know, there are probably assumptions to, to examine too about if some of the choices you're making are poor or if they're actually ones that just don't feel good. So sleeping in, for example, may be exactly what's called for sometimes during this healing process. Maybe if, if you were, you know, at full capacity, it would be a poor choice. But uh, but maybe it's it's something that you need. There's a, there's a deeper level of questioning that we can 
apply to to some of the things you've described like um, you know what if my put my max pull-ups go way down after this a lot of the time the traditional cbt approach would be to well, let's let's question that assumption like like who says it's going to go way down you know it'll probably come up pretty quickly muscle memory you'll get right back uh you know so quickly and and that can all be true but again that that reinforces this assumption that you can only be okay if your max pull-ups are some certain number which forces a tenuous relationship between you and peace you can only be at peace if you can you know reach a certain level so from a mindfulness approach we could we could open to that and be like yeah yeah maybe my my max whatever is going to be down after this and that'll be where i am not necessarily where i stay but that's that's how things might be and 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 maybe my value as a human being doesn't depend on being able to always perform like a machine. Yeah, that that you just you found the wound and mm -hmm. you poured the salt in and you twisted the knife. You 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 found it because that it's it's not just about a number; it's about an identity. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, having spent five years focused on this goal, going from award-winning dad bod could barely do a few pull-ups. And when I was training my uh, students a few months ago, uh, cause I have a, a group where I train people for Spartan races and they were finding what's their max pull-up. I got in front of them, did 25, boom. I'd never done anything like that before. That was now my identity. It was public. It was in front of my students. I am somebody that can do 25 pull-ups without coming off the bar. So now who am I? If I go and I teach that same group again in two months and I can only bust out 10. That's now, I mean, I'm legitimately feeling the emotions of how do I accept who I am if I can only do 10 and not 25. So using your approach, especially with this mindfulness, how do I confront the fact that there's a very real emotion that I'm feeling? Mm. I mean, it started with, with acknowledging that you have a lot of, I have a lot of strong feelings about this. And a lot of my identity is wrapped up in being this high achiever and having this public persona. And I mean, it's without going too deep here, it feels like there is some, I mean, obviously valuable work to do around, you know, what's the meaning of that identity and what is it, there, there's obviously nothing wrong with, with taking pleasure in, you know, our, our abilities and our talents. Um, but when they come to so define us that, that the idea of losing them is, is terrifying, then Again, it's nothing to feel bad about or to see as a shortcoming, but there's just, there's a deeper piece that's available. And I think if people are interested in that deeper piece, then opening to, opening to more of life as it is and questioning, questioning these society-wide delusions we have about what our happiness depends on. I think that's just so valuable. And I think that really what this uh, comes to, and this is kind of where I want to wrap it up. Um, I've talked about this with multiple guests, one of them uh, recently, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Champagne, uh, he wrote a book that's called Personal Socrates, that's all about how we ask ourselves better questions, and I have talked yeah, about yeah. this for years, that the better the quality of the questions you ask of yourself, or frankly of others, is what's going to lead to a higher quality of life. Mm -hmm. And what I've already learned here is that the question that's been in my mind is when the time comes that I'm ready to train again, what do I need to do to get back to doing 25 pull-ups? And a new question could be, what do I need to do with being okay with the fact that I can only do 10? Mm. So give me an example. And, and it could be in a middle ground where I might end up getting back to 25, but whether it's 10 or six or 15, whatever that number is, is kind of irrelevant. What are, th what are habits or behaviors that I can integrate into my regular practice such that I can get closer to being okay with whatever the number is. I mean, the, the question that comes to mind is, what do I need to do now in order to be the best I can be in this moment? And that's that's different from day to day, from you know month to month, year to year. It's not limiting in that it's not saying, how do I need to only ever be able to do 10 and that's fine. Like if you're if you're able to do more in any I mean weights career uh, family whatever then 
you know, imposing restrictions on yourself isn't, that's not helpful either, you know, to say I'm going to live small. Uh, but, but being willing to embody fully who you are, whether that's bigger than, you, quote unquote, bigger than you are now or, or smaller than you are now, I think that's, um, that we can find with the right question, which again, I think is about what's actually happening now and how can I, how can I meet what's happening now, right where it is and, um, you know, come back to peace. How can I make, how can I make peace with life? How can I make peace with life as it is? You know, that it's a bit of a cliche, but, but the idea of life on life's terms. Yeah, and peace is a, 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 I think it's a word that younger people probably they know, but they, it isn't something that they feel or they acknowledge or they're working towards. And I think the kind of the place I want to wrap it up, which is going to get very big and existential very, very quickly. So it might, might not be the easiest place to wrap up, but I know that it's, it's a conversation that I've continually had, which is under, and this is a, this is a question that I've asked a multitude of uh, guests in this realm where we've talked about how do we define the difference between the words happiness and fulfillment, because they can be two very different things. And now I want to integrate the word peace into that because happiness versus fulfillment versus peace all potentially mean very, very different things. And I feel that there's a certain period of our life, we're really working towards happiness. And then we inevitably don't get it. And then hopefully you reach a point where you want to work towards some sense of fulfillment. But even then you're like, I just, I kind of want to be at peace. So I realize it could be a very big, gigantic existential question, but um, you know, what are your thoughts on the, the differentiate between those, uh, those three ideas? Yeah. I mean, the, the first two I think are, are often captured. I mean, happiness can mean different things, but if we, if we imagine that it's sort of like, like a, what they call a hedonic mm -hmm. sense, you know, of like I'm feeling positive. I feel good. Uh, I'm, I'm experiencing pleasure. Then that's, that's one way to live, try to have the most enjoyment and pleasure in your life. And then that hedonic approach is often contrasted with what's called eudaimonia, a eudaimonic approach. I think it's Aristotle's idea of rather than asking about how can I maximize pleasure, it's how can I maximize the meaning, we might say fulfillment in life. And so maybe, you know, maybe that includes, you know, doing something for a child or, or volunteering in a way that diminishes our in the moment pleasure, but increases our sense of, of meaning, purpose, fulfillment. Uh, and there are lots of studies showing that, that focusing on, on meaning and purpose is a much more reliable way to actually to live a happy life. You don't usually find true happiness by pursuing it directly. I would, where I see peace fitting in with both of those is it feels, it feels like the ground that both of them can kind of be be contained within, which is I can experience, let's say, if I'm not having a lot of uh, pleasure or joy, uh, or, or let's say happiness, I can still be at peace with that. I can find peace through, I, I can make peace with that experience. All right, that's where I am right now. I'm not always on top of the world and, and that can be okay. The way I'm saying these, Zach, it can sound like a like sort of trite, uh, just like automatic, like, yeah, just snap your fingers and you'll be okay with it. It tends to take practice, but it, it can happen relatively quickly. Um, just, you know, through an insight of like, oh, why am I assuming that I have to make this experience stop? And the same goes for meaning or for fulfillment. I think we can, you know, maybe we had certain aspirations or certain you know things we imagined would really give our lives purpose and meaning and fulfillment. And most of us probably find that we don't reach all of those, those things or we reach them and they didn't, they don't provide the ultimate satisfaction that we had imagined. And again, I think that's where, where we can find a more enduring peace that isn't dependent on these outside circumstances, but it does come, I think with, or it does require, uh, intention and and commitment to to a different way of seeing things of allowing our minds to be transformed um, into sort of a different pattern than the one that pervades our world 
I would say that was a very deft and well done way to navigate an almost impossible question to answer. And it actually gave me a couple of really interesting insights. Uh, and then we can go ahead and we can wrap it up. But this idea of if we're chasing fulfillment, especially on this hedonic treadmill, we're never going to get there. But if you chase fulfillment, happiness kind of becomes a side effect or a byproduct of it. That's and right. what, I, what I have found is that um, if I were to classify the amount of happiness that I have on any given day, week or month, it's not off the charts. However, the amount of fulfillment that I now have in the work that I do, the people that I work with, even the, the fact that I'm dealing with this injury and I'm kind of in this place of being a little bit down and lower energy, I'm still very, very at peace with the work that I'm doing that's leading to this fulfillment, even if right now I'm not very happy. And the way that yeah, you kind of yeah. said that like peace is kind of the foundation laid for both of them. I think, like I said, this it's a really challenging question to navigate and I didn't even really expect an answer. And I feel like your answer really kind of kind of nailed it and it's helped me mm -hmm. look at all three of them and understand them in a different light. So I, I very much appreciate you, uh, you bringing that to the table. Oh, well, thanks Zach. I, it was a good question and I uh, appreciate your, your, uh, Nice words about it. So the, the place that I want to wrap up is an exercise I do with some guests, but not all, but I think this one could be applicable. In this exercise, you're going to do a little bit of time traveling. And I want you to travel back. It might not be to exactly the moment where you're having conversations via notepads, but in that realm of how am I going to continue a practice of being a therapist and doing talk therapy when I have no voice and I am absolutely exhausted, napping all the time, can barely get out of bed, knowing what you know now and what you've been through, what would you tell yourself? You know, it's, it's interesting because I, I feel like so many of the things I ended up finding so helpful in the end, I, I knew at the time, but I didn't know them. You know, you know, you, it's like there's this metaphor of cycling the puck where, you know, you, the idea keeps coming around. You keep looking for an opening, but it doesn't quite doesn't quite hit the goal, doesn't quite register. But something, if I could have communicated to myself in some way that I was loved, and not in just like uh, your love because your your family cares about you, which they they absolutely do in a very, I mean, foundational way. Not just because of you know anything i've done but a more sort of foundational sense and this is this is my own personal view but that that love is inherent in experience and that there's love available in every moment even if i feared all the all the losses that i imagined and that i many of which i ended up experiencing i think in a way i was afraid of losing love through that losing love that came through being able to perform in a certain way or be a certain person realizing i could never actually lose the the love that's that's woven into everything that is i mean that ultimately became uh very redeeming and um and if i could have realized that even sooner that would have been all right i would say that's a pretty profound realization um hopefully for everybody listening, certainly for myself, just going back to this idea of if we're really going to dig deep, will people still love me if I don't maintain whatever this image is? Going back to this idea of the, the pull-ups. Well, the only reason that my students would know me or love me or respect me or admire me is because I'm the guy that can do 25 pull-ups. So does that mean if I can now only do 10, now the, the level of love lessens, if we're going to use that word, well, I would say the odds of that are probably pretty slim, but that's, that's one of the fears that we confront. So I think that that's, that's a really good place to, to be able to end this conversation and realizing that that's most likely always going to be there. And if the fear is of, uh, of losing that, it's probably, like you said, there is, there isn't a lot of evidence that would support that hypothesis. So I think, right. I think that's a, that's a very profound way and uh, place to end this uh, I appreciate very much your time knowing that uh, energy is an ongoing challenge for you. We've muscled through an entire 90 minute conversation. You were on four hours of sleep. 
uh, did an amazing job, led to some really great insights. Very much appreciate your time. And I want to make sure that I leave people knowing where they can get resources from you if they find that this can be beneficial. So where's the best place to send my listeners and viewers today? Yeah, thanks. Uh, they can go to sethgillahan.com. It's my website. All my, my resources are there, my blog. I have online courses I'm pretty excited about uh, where I offer mindful CBT for uh, anxiety, stress, worry, and a brand new course on depression. So it's the best place to find me. And as I understand it, you also have a, a free guide that is the 10 ways to manage stress and anxiety every day. That's right. Yeah, they can get that through my website and uh, they can also get a, a weekly newsletter where I, um, I I try to keep it super helpful for people like, you know, stuff they can actually use and not just like, there's a bunch of stuff about me. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I, I, you and I see it the same way. Like my, my job as somebody that writes a newsletter is to make sure that I'm providing value to the right people. I'm meeting them where they are understanding yeah. their needs. And even in some reversion of a discourse where I'm sending that information to you and you can reply if you'd like, I want to make sure it's valuable and not here's all the latest and greatest things that I'm doing. Here's what I'm working on and click on this link and watch this thing. Like I just, I can't stand that stuff. Yeah, so we're, yeah. we're on the same page about the, the value and purpose of a newsletter. So yeah, right on. Uh, having said all of that, uh, immensely appreciative of your time, of your expertise, of your energy and bringing what you did have today and um, knocking it out of the park. So can't thank you enough for being here. Thanks for a great conversation, Zach.